Good evening, everyone. Delighted to have with us here this evening, then, Mohamedou Al-Slahi. Um, Uh, who you've just seen his experience in the film you've just seen. Kevin MacDonald, who's the director of the film. Thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, Nancy Hollander by Zoom from the US. Nancy, of course, was Mohamedou's lawyer while he was detained in Guantanamo. And finally, I'm really pleased to have with us here this evening Andy Worthington, who's yes. a journalist. <laughs> and an expert, and an expert on Guantanamo. So thank you all for joining us this evening. We're going to have um, questions coming from the audience, but I'm just going to start off just with a couple of questions myself, um, just to make to start things off this evening. Um, so, Mohamedou, obviously extremely moving the film and it's extremely moving to see your experience um, during your time in Guantanamo. What was it that, that sort of kept you, kept you going, kept you focused when you were in detention for all of that time? I really, Sarah asked what kept me going. I don't know, but I think it's a mix of a lot of things. But one of the most powerful things that I know in my heart, when I was in my cell, that I forgave everyone, and I had, I held no grudge whatsoever against anyone, and that gave me peace of mind, gave me some kind of freedom that no one can take away from me. Of course, of course, the cultural upbringing, you know, the way I was brought up, you know, to forgive and to be nice and kind to people was very helpful to me. And I made a, ca uh, a vow of kindness that I don't intend to break. I want to be a kind person. And I will be a kind person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohamedou. Um, and Kevin, what drew you to, um, to want to share Mohamedou's story in the film? What brought you to, to having the film produced? Well, obviously there's been a lot of films about the war on terror from many different aspects over the last 20 something years. And I felt that the perspective of someone like Mohamedou had never been told. Someone who was the victim of this from the Muslim side, someone who was a prisoner in Guantanamo. And when we were releasing this film, I was amazed to talk to some American journalists who said, you know, this is the first mainstream American movie ever to feature a sympathetic Muslim lead. And I couldn't believe that. Actually, I thought that must be a mistake. And I then went and tried to find other examples, and actually there, wa there weren't any. Um, and, but I think that gives you some sense of why it felt important to tell this story, because it hasn't been told. People maybe think they know what happened at Guantanamo. They think that they know about the war on terror, but they've only seen it really from one side or one and a half sides. And more than anything else, I wasn't going to do the movie until I Zoomed with Mohamedou. I had a Zoom call with Mohamedou, and I was so amazed by him and by his perspective on his experiences and his ability to forgive that I thought this is a remarkable man and I want to make a film about him that will bring attention to his character and his experience. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and what I'd like to do now is hand the, the question time over to, to you in the audience. So I believe there's someone who's going to go around with a microphone to, um, it's a bit difficult for me to see everybody, but w would you like to just put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question to, to Nancy, Andy, or anyone else on the panel? Uh, the gentleman on the left there, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, an excellent film. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Nancy, this is, this is a question really for you, I think. Uh, thir over 13 years ago, Obama said that he would close Guantanamo. Biden said a year, just over a year ago, that he would close Guantanamo. And Guantanamo 
continues to be open. Why do you think that is? What happened to Obama? Uh, it's unbelievable to me that it is still open. Um, there, it's not that hard to close it. It can be done. Ten people approximately have already been cleared for release. Um, the others who are so-called forever prisoners have to just go home. We don't have forever prisoners in this country. And then the others, uh, they need to resolve them. In fact, there are now plea negotiations going on with the 5911 people, which might get somewhere. But there's no reason, that, that's a long answer to your question, the reason is the lack of political will. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Um, could I have another question, please, from the audience? Um, the woman in the middle of there? The hand up there? Thank you. Hi, Mohamedou, when you first met Nancy, at what point did you think that she would actually be able to help you? Or did you immediately know that this was going to be someone who was, would be able to change your life? Uh, when I met Nancy, I, was, I had been almost four years in prison. And I'm not a lawyer, but I would give you this advice. Whenever the police arrest you, do not wait for years <laughs> to talk to your lawyer. It's really a very bad thing to do. <laughs> so at that point, I had nothing to lose. Okay. You know, I, I was already tortured, and I falsely confessed to heinous crimes that didn't happen, let alone I did them. And uh, so, and when I was young, I used to watch two of my favorite shows. Mm. Uh, Married with Children. Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> so, and the other one is Law and Order. And I thought this is America. This was a very big mistake. And this is now Law and Order. And now I will be acquitted, the, you know, the underdog. And I was really happy. And I remember when she came to me, you know, I was so happy and overwhelmed. And then I want to hug her. But there was a table, mm. and they set it up so, like, just like a table like this in front of me. And then there is a door, you know, and then the lawyer sit next to the door because they tell them you need to sit next to the door because the detainees may be very violent mm -hmm. so you can run for your life. And then I tried to hug them from over the table but I could only reach so far because they couldn't see that I was bolted to the ground so I right. was shackled. And then there was like some second that seemed like forever. <laughs> and then we ended up hugging and I really believed in Nancy and her team the first day we met. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, who would like to ask a, a question next? You've got someone just in front of you there actually. Hi, uh, my name is Paulina. Um, uh, my question is for Nancy, but in fact also for Mohamedou and um, Andrew, I think it is. Um, maybe all of you. Um, um, only f a few weeks ago, um, the US Supreme Court uh, ruled that in the case of um, another detainee, Abu uh, Zubaydah, um, who is still in Guantanamo, as far as I know, um, uh, that um, the US government was entitled to invoke um, what they call state secret privilege, uh, which essentially means that classified information cannot be used as evidence. Um, how important do you think this is in terms of accountability to what happened to, to all these detainees? Is there any hope that any accountability can ever happen? Did 
Yeah, I'll pass it over to Andy to start us off with. Um, it's an interesting um, situation. The United States government has tried to hide perpetually since all this began 20 years ago, to hide all evidence of torture, even when that information has come into the public realm through, for example, you know, a, a huge Senate Intelligence Committee report into the CIA's torture program. Um, in which a, a, a lot of information was made available, even though the full report remains classified. And in fact, this ruling in the case of Abu Zubaydah, where his lawyers are trying to find out information specifically about what happened to him in one of the black sites he was held in, in Poland, where they don't know any details about, about you know, the ins and outs of everything that happened to him. And this is to help with an ongoing Polish prosecution. Um, and yet the U.S. government's persistent position is that state secrets re require that no information is disclosed. And what happened in this case is that there were, although the Supreme Court backed the government, there were two dissents, and one of the dissent was from a liberal judge, but the other dissent was from a right-wing judge, um, a Republican nominee. Um, and and what's, what was important about what was said was the ridiculousness, really, and the lawlessness of the government consistently seeking to defend, the, uh, to prevent the disclosure of information about the torture program, even though so much of that has already been publicly disclosed. So it, it suggests to me that there's, the edifice of secrecy is slightly crumbling. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure where else it's going to go. I think one of the problems with the trials that we've heard mentioned. So of the 38 men that are still held, 10 of them are facing trials. And these trials go round and round like Groundhog Day. They never, they never get to the trial phase. They're stuck in pretrial hearings because the prosecutors on one side are trying to hide all evidence of torture and the defense teams on the other side are saying, we can't have what even looks like a fair trial without disclosing the evidence of the torture. So it goes round and round. It may be that the plea deals are the, are the way forward. I've yet, you know, we are, it's very early days. We don't know whether these men who have been accused of involvement in the actual terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001, whether they're going to agree to some kind of plea deal. Um, it looks like it would be the only way forward. But then again, maybe that will also mean that the torture doesn't get raised, that the torture once more gets buried. But I would have to say that, that what has happened in America over the last 20 years is that torture, which became, was, was official government policy from 9-11 from on the part of the Bush administration, torture infects the countries that practice it. And torture has infected the United States. I would say that it's, that it's a fair thing to say that it has actually poisoned and infected the soul of the United States, and that if you don't deal with that, um, it continues to, to spread its poison, which is why ultimately there needs to be a reckoning about it. Um, and I, I, I just hope that we can, we can keep moving on, um, on uncovering those terrible things that happened. And, and I, think it's, you know, I think it's great that everybody came tonight, because you see the difference between what the United States government said was necessary and who it was that they were actually doing that to. Um, and that gulf is profoundly shocking and indicative of quite how wrong the United States was. Thank you very much, Andy. Did anyone else on the panel want to respond to that question as well and refer to accountability and what, what, uh, uh, what's the way forward in terms of accountability? I couldn't hear the question, but I think it was, what, what's the way forward? Is that the question? Yes, basically, yeah. I'd like to say two quick things about that. Of course, under the treaties that the United States uh, has signed, the, particularly the Treaty Against uh, Torture, um, it's supposed to prosecute. That's part of the treaty, is to prosecute those who are suspected of being torturers, and in our case, in the U.S. case, Mohamedou's case, 
in the case of my other client, Abrahim El Nasri, and the other client, other defendants um, and prisoners, we know who the torturers were, and nobody's being prosecuted. And it also requires that uh, those who were tortured get um, damages, and of course, that's not happened either. I mean, it's not the first time that the U.S. has violated a treaty. It generally violates whatever treaties it feels like, but. There is an accountability in the European courts, and the European Court of Human Rights has um, written extensive opinions um, and has made it clear to the world what happened to Abu Zubaida, to my client, um, Abrahim al Nasri, Mohamedou's book and, and the movie make clear what happened to him. And that's how we get accountability, which is to get it out into the open um, and, and make sure that the whole world understands what happened. And, and so it doesn't happen again. I mean, this is not the first time the U.S. has tortured people. And people should not think that this just came out of the blue. It didn't. There's a long history in the U.S. But bringing this out into the open through books, through movies, through court opinions, um, through a dissent like Justice Gorsuch saying this is ridiculous uh, to keep this secret, we'll, we'll get it out there. The, the United States has a, a law, an executive order that, re, that creates what is classified. Uh, what isn't. And one of the things it specifically says is that the United States government cannot classify evidence just to avoid embarrassment to the government. And that's exactly what it has done. There, there are no secrets here anymore. There's no sources and methods here anymore. There's no countries. I can't even tell you what the countries were, maybe, you know, but they, 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 they're, they're open, they're out there. And that it's ridiculous for the U.S. government to continue to take this position. And one of the justifications the government has is that they promised the countries where this happened that they wouldn't make this public. But if, in fact, a country has started investigating it and has admitted that it happened, how can that be true? And one of the things... Um, that was said in that opinion was, well, a former government officer admitted it. The former government officer was a former prime minister of the country at issue that said we tortured, we, we allowed people to be tortured on our, uh, on our country, in our country. And it, so it makes no sense, but this is what we're stuck with. We don't really have in the U.S. A, res a court we can rely on. Um, we don't have a legislature we can rely on. And if we can't rely on the president, we've pretty much lost it all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy, for that, for your answer and for Andy for responding to that question as well. Is there anybody on, on maybe this side of the auditorium who um, has been wanting to ask a question? This gentleman here in the red jumper? Having regard for your respect for America and your love of their American TV shows, um, are you allowed into America now? Have you been back there? And if not, would you like to go? Uh, uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Hugo. So, very simple questions. Uh, I'm banned from the U.S. forever, which is what I could... Uh, what I would call a win-win situation. <laughs> I'm really scared to go uh, to the U.S. because anyone, anyone could be arrested by the U.S. on suspicion. By the time they prove their innocence, their life would have been thoroughly destroyed. So this is the United States we are dealing with, and Nancy already said it, there is no accountability 
to the crimes that some people in the United States uh, commit. I say it, when I say this, I have to confess that American people, as I know them, by and large, are good human beings. They stood by me. I never forget uh, a private and a specialist, Scott. Uh, I was in, it was in the thick of my torture program, and he came to me and he gave me blueberry muffin. It's very tasty, I'm telling you. And I was scared. I didn't know what to do. He would just throw it inside my cell and go away. And jeopardizing his career and everything. If they had they caught him, he would have been disciplined. He would have been probably kicked out of the army. And that is very indicative, actually. American people are very loud. Everyone has an opinion, and they want to be liked, you know? That's what I really, uh, and yes, and I love American comedy, and I watch useless American comedy every day. If I could just add as well, Mohammed is not the only former Guantanamo prisoner who's not allowed in the United States. No former Guantanamo prisoner is allowed to go there. And I've spoken to former prisoners in the past who very understandably share Mohamedou's concerns that even if a United States government in the future were to say, no, come, how could they possibly trust that that would be a safe thing to do? But as you all know from tonight, the power of understanding how wrong Guantanamo is can really be helped by being able to actually meet a former prisoner. And that's one thing that the United States people are shut off from. I have to say that since COVID and Zoom meetings have taken over, um, it's actually been enlightening for a lot of American audiences because people like Mohamedou and Mansour Adafi, who lives in Serbia, have been taking part regularly in conversations directly with the American people, and that's been a good thing. But there is something shameful about the way that not a single prisoner is allowed to go and address the country that caused them all these horrors in the first place. Thank you very much, Mohamedou and Andy, for, for your answers there. Um, so I'm having to put my, that because it's uh, quite blinding the light. Um, in the center, there's a gentleman just in front of me with his hand up there. If we could have a question from you, please. I would like to ask one question here about Guantanamo. And uh, who is the be beneficial of uh, keeping it uh, open all this time? And we don't know when is it going to close. Who is benefiting from that? Who benefits from keeping Guantanamo open? I have two very quick answers. One is um, politicians and, and their supporters, primarily Republicans who like the notion of having overturned the law so that you can hold people forever without charge or trial. They like that power. That is a very dark thing. The other thing I think we should look at is uh, contractors. Who's making money out of keeping open a facility that costs $450 million a year? Nancy may have some other thoughts and maybe my other friends here. Well, they're, they're actually building a new courthouse now and a new area for the press. So. Uh, yes, the contractors, Halliburton was one of the major contractors. I'm not sure who it is now. Um, but the, the, reason, the reason that President Biden, I believe, has done nothing is because of the fear of the Republicans and the, the right wing and also Democrats um, who uh, think that Everyone there is a terrorist, and if you let somebody out, there's going to be another terror attack. And that's what they've told people. That's what they've told their constituents. Um, so it's really up to us to, to change that. Um, it, and let me just add, it's what I do when I go around this country um, showing the film. We're going to show the film at a film festival in Alabama um, in the middle of you know, Republican territory next month, and um, showing the film, 
showing uh, Lawrence Topham's film that gives people inspiration that things can change. Uh, those are the kinds of things that get people involved and help them understand what's happened. So, you know, a lot more people will look at a film uh, or YouTube than will ever read a book, unfortunately, at least in this country. So it's really, really powerful stuff for people to see it, if they, even if they can't see Muhammadu directly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, another question, please. There's a young woman here just in the, in the middle there. Or just further along that line there, with your hand up. So basically, the young, young lady here, the young woman here was saying well, it was very, very moving to, to see what's been done, um, but what can young people like herself and other young people do to try and stop um, what's happening at Guantanamo, for example? What's the best thing that they can do? Well, for, for any lawyers or law students in the audience, um, they can continue to fight um, anytime the government overreaches and never give up because lawyers have incredible power to affect change. And anyone has the power to affect change also. Um, speak out, talk to your friends, have a book club where you engage with this book, show the film, uh, show the film anywhere you can and show um, the 20 minute um, film that Lawrence Topham did about my brother's keeper also about how Muhammadu and his guard Steve Wood became friends so that people people need to know I think that good can come out of um, tragic situations and in addition to people knowing people working so this will never happen again the more people who see Kevin's film, the more people who hear about it, and the more people who realize that we can have a country without torture, um, the more people who will fight against it. And that, that's what we can do. What we're doing here today is what we can do. Um, I mean, if you know someone in government, you can, you can go there and talk to them. But mostly just communicate to people so they know what happened. That's how we keep things from happening again, in my view. Thank you, Nancy. Mohamedou, would you like to respond to that question as well? Say a few words. What can young people do? Yes, you are so close to getting kicked out. So <laughs> I'm writing her out, she's half Iranian. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really, I just want to second what Nancy said, and you have the power to change because you are uh, a UK citizen, and UK, uh, the country of the UK, is the closest ally of the United States of America. So they listen to your leaders. Not always, but they listen to them more than anyone, and just like Nancy said, if you are a law student, you are a lawyer. If not, just join like Amnesty International or other organization because they are doing a great job of defending people, you know. I mean, no one wanted to defend us. And you saw the movie and Nancy was called a terrorist lawyer, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. And I just wanted to add something myself as well as, as someone who's a law lecturer and, and teaches students. Um, and just to say, the Law Society at Brighton University, we had a showing of the film on Thursday and it really moved the law students there. And I'd, I'd really recommend, um, you know, students, if they don't have a, an amnesty group already set up at their university or their sixth form college or their school, you can have, a, a, you can have, you can have our amnesty groups at secondary schools. And I've taken a lot of students from local schools in Lewis up to London to demonstrations over the years. And there's going to be a weekly vigil starting again outside Parliament calling for the closure of Guantanamo. And all students, everyone's going to be welcome at that vigil. So um, please come and give me your email if you'd like to be part of that vigil and be on the streets because we've got a lot of campaigning to do. Okay, any more questions? We're going to probably have to stop fairly soon. This gentleman on the right there. What I was struck by in the film um, at points was what looks like this sheer inequality of arms. Um, 
from this prosecutor's office with all of these lawyers working with hundreds of boxes to them suddenly being dumped on effectively Nancy Hollander and her junior associate um, in a room in the middle of nowhere. How important, Kevin, was it to, or was it important to, to put that across as part of the film, uh, first of all? And if, if Nancy can hear me, um, I know she's just spoken very bravely and courageously about her work, but could you give us some insight into what it's like as, as a lawyer in America dealing with that, with, with the weight of the state against you as, as one lawyer? Thank you. Uh, well, I'll answer very briefly. Um, it's a movie, it's very simplified. <laughs> and uh, Nancy obviously was working alone to a certain extent, but she also did have, and I think as time went on more and more, had the help of the ACLU. And there were other lawyers involved in, in, in this case in, in, in small ways. Um, so she wasn't completely alone. But I think it's fair to say that in the period after the movie covers, so after Mohamedou has won his habeas hearing, but the Obama administration has appealed and he's stuck for, I think, a further seven years in prison, Nancy and Terry did go every month, every two months, to visit Mohamedou uh, at their own expense uh, to spend a couple of days with him uh, to be with him, to encourage him, even at times when I think it was really very, very desperate because it felt, I think, to Mohammed as though he had uh, used up all his legal opportunities. So I think, I think that um, they didn't do it completely alone, but they showed incredible individual courage and compassion. Uh, it looked like in the movie that you and Terry were doing this completely on your own, and whereas Couch, Colonel Couch had a large team of people, and I was saying that wasn't strictly true because you had the ACLU and other people, but maybe you want to comment on, on that. Well, <clears throat> Ter Terry and I did do most of it, and Terry is uh, equally involved with me. I mean, we, she was involved right from the very beginning. So we were both, we were both in it, um, and, and some other lawyers, and the ACLU joined us just uh, shortly before the first hearing um, with Mohamedou and were there staunchly, Hina Shamsi, all the way, all the way through with us. But it, Terry and I were the ones who visited Mohamedou during those years just to pay social visits and promised him that as long as he was there, we'd be there um, because we, we had no idea whether he, when or whether he would ever get out. Um, but uh, Terry doesn't get the credit she deserves. She uh, never said those things that are in the movie. Um, Terry's character <laughs> was really a combination of Terry and someone else who did leave, and she became a proxy for the audience. I mean, the audience is thinking, what, you know, how can you defend him? He's guilty. And Terry takes on. Uh, or Kevin had Terry take on that role, uh, even though she would never do that, and Terry agreed to it because she understood the necessity for the movie. Um, I must say that at the end of that scene, um, if I can say this word, we're not on television, so I guess I can, um, the last words of that scene where I turn or Jody turns and says, you've got to believe your own shit, those are my words. And uh, I guess I must have said it to Jody at some point. But those are my words, and that's true. When you're in a trial, no matter how bad it looks, you've got to believe that you can win. And we had that belief, and we stuck with it. Um, and finally, it happened. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think... We're coming to, to the sort of end of time for questions, but um, if maybe if we just have one more question before we um, finish off the evening, because there is going to be an opportunity to, to meet Mohamedou and, and have a book signed um, by Mohamedou if you'd like to, to have that done. Oh, that gentleman up there, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Mohamedou, my name is uh, Roland. Um, the, the film at the end uh, left things rather open about your, your life, and I hope you don't mind us asking, that you were looking for somewhere to live with your wife, that there were some visa issues. W where are you both now? Uh, yes. 
Yes, now I'm living in the good country of the Netherlands. And I'm very happy. <laughs> now, I just want to, to thank everybody who's made this evening possible. I'd like to thank all of the staff and volunteers who've been working so hard this evening at this beautiful venue in Tunbridge Wells, including Susan Cooper, the duty manager, um, and Elizabeth Finchmore, the marketing and communications director. Um, above all, at the theatre, I would like to thank Felicia De Angelo, um, who has been doing an extraordinary amount of work to organise the event so wonderfully this evening. And she's been working closely with Dominique O'Neill from the Kent Amnesty Network. So thank you to all those people. Um, and also to, to Mark Clive B and Graham Minter from the Amnesty Group. Um, of course, like to thank all our members of the uh, the panel here this evening. Um, like to thank Nancy Hollander, Kevin McDonald, Mohamedou, of course, and Andy. I'd also like to do a quick mention also to two people, two very special people who are with us today, who I think aren't thanked enough, and that is Bernie and Susie here at the front, because they have actually been organising a month-long tour for Mohamedou, and they're sitting down here at the front, and they, uh, they don't come up on the stage and, or anything, but they've been doing so much work, and I think it's a huge credit to you both, all the work you've done, and to Oriel uh, Marshall, who's not here tonight. So I do want you to be recognised, okay? Um, but so thank you, thank you everybody um, for, I think I've included everybody that I wanted to include, um, but also thank you, the audience, for coming. I mean, it's, it's you know, not, it's not the warmest night. It's, this, this film is available, you know, on different avenues, but you've made the choice to come out here tonight and make a difference by showing up. So thank you very much. Um, there's an action you can take in the reception to close Guantanamo at the Amnesty table, and there will be um, book signing happening now as well. So thank you. <laughs>